evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christina Koppel. I'd like to welcome you all here today. We have a wonderful program for you tonight. About over a little over a year ago, Char called me and said she had this great idea for putting together music to some wonderful poetry that she's seen and known in Wisconsin. And she was going through ideas, and we decided we're going to make this work. We're going to come up with this great idea. And, and so after all the planning and practicing, rehearsing, Tonight is the final night, and we're so proud to present it to you this evening. So, without any further ado, Charles Knievers is saying this with Poet Song. gave us the gift of their poems, which were the seeds of this project. None of the poets have heard the music that I've written using his or her poem, and that is a surprise and my gift to them. The musicians, the poets, and I hope that you will all enjoy the variety of these expressions in the 12 poems and pieces, and we thank you for the gift of your presence. Songs, Wisconsin Year and Song Premiere will take us on a poetic musical journey tonight. Although each poet song can stand alone, all of the poet songs are related and were created as a musical unit, flowing with ease from one month to the next, just as our months and seasons do in Wisconsin. For each month, I'll read program notes about each poet song and then introduce the poet to read his or her poem. Following the reading, we'll hear the musical poet song. Let's begin with January and Poet Antler's poem, Looking Up at the Milky Way Thought. Looking Up at the Milky Way Thought uses medieval chant-like harmonies of parallel fifths to convey the meditative, mystical emotion of Antler's poem. The chant motif intensifies with the growing insistence of the poet's vision to at last relax into ascending arpeggio, piano progression, which foreshadows a melodic refrain of the next composition, Spring Sonnet. It's my pleasure to introduce our first poet this evening, Anthony. Looking up at the Milky Way thought, what must it be like for fish watching ice form on the surface of their lake, or looking up at fish frozen in the ice above them and feeling the water thickening around them till they too can't move, but are still alive, looking up seeing falling snow slowly cover the ice till darkness engulfs their realm. A poet on his back on snow-covered ice, looking up at the Milky Way, thought.
for the month of February, Spring Sonnet is the name of a poem by Barbara Cohen Houghton. Spring Sonnet has three definitive musical sections. Part A is a light declarative vocal rendering of Miss Houghton's poem with a plaintive rising refrain. This grows into a viola solo of section B, which introduces new melodic material, the viola solo. The work finally breaks into section C's joyful, syncopated, upbeat melody, which quotes and expounds upon the refrain from part A. In the final measures of the piece, the careful listener will catch small echoes of the chant-like motif from looking up at the Milky Way thought. The composer emphasizes the relationship between the themes of these two poems, one about winter times freezing and dying, the other about springtime's sap being set free and life's return. She felt inspired to wrap the seeds of each of these expressions inside the other, since they are inseparably linked. Please welcome Barbara Cohen Coden, who will read her poem, Spring Song. <laughs> Spring Sonnet. When first I hear the drip of melting snow and February's page is facing out, then down the basement steps I quickly go to gather brace and bit and tube and spout. Outside, I make a trail from tree to tree. At each I pause, acknowledge spirit's role. Then, Slowly, slowly, set the sweet sap free. Insert a spile in every dripping hole. Meanwhile, the sky is reamed by eager wings as geese bore northward toward their summer home. The sap of spring that rises in me sings to join the goose cries. I am not alone. The geese and I are here because we know that life is stirring deep beneath the snow. Stay. 
for the month of March, St. Pat's Day is a poem by Jack Jane. Mr. Jane, St. Pat's Day is the shortest of poems selected by the composer. To draw out the experience of this delightful poem, the safe has composed a set of variations which, which are repeated in different ways using the well-known tune, Irish Washerwoman, as a source of the musical material. The variations include an opening ballad with an Irish flute descant, followed by a heroic, robust section. Next, a vocal drone variation with the piano playing fast fragments of the tune above the voice, culminating in the fourth variation, a contest of sorts, as the tenor tries to keep pace with the Irish flutist to break the musical code and earn his coveted emerald gene. For the month of March, please welcome Jack Jane, who will read his poem, St. Pat's Day. St. Pat's Day. No matter how noble my paternity, I must search and seek till eternity to unwind my double helix strand, to break the code, I demand at least one emerald gene. <laughs> Let's see. 
statue of Kosciusko charges the Super America as futilely, valiantly as the Polish cavalry charged the invading Nazi tanks.
Wolf Walk is the poem for me, a poem by Charlotte A. Coutet. The poet's experience with a wolf expresses the excitement of connecting with something that is wild and free. The safest uses a lyrical minor melody to carry the moment-to-moment -moment unfolding of the evocative encounter. Near the end of Wolf Walk, the audience is invited to howl in response to the singer's cue. <laughs> Ms. Charbonneau will first howl herself like the alpha female wolf. Then she will cue you, the audience, to howl in response by raising her arm. As she slowly lowers her arm, the audience howls should fade out. She, she will cue the audience to howl three different times. The audience howls should be fairly quiet and distance so that the music underneath can be still heard. Rebecca, how about a practice howl? Okay. <coughs> oh. Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> Since our poet uh, Charlotte Cote could not be with us tonight, it is my pleasure to read her poem, Wolf Walk. It is a night for walking. The moon rides high, white, round. I follow the river, dry grasses crunch underfoot, soft gurgle of water in the darkness below. An owl hoots, a cricket chirps, frogs fall suddenly silent, and I smell a wildness on the wind, feel a warmth nearby. She is but a leap away, head held high, ears pricked forward, our eyes meet. One soft whine escapes her lips. Then she turns, lopes away. Moments later, the howl. And she waits my answer.
For the month of June, the name of the poem is Kerosene Lamp, and the poet is Charles Zapis. This childhood memory song from a poem by the composer begins with the soprano singing about a special summer tradition at Grandfather's Cottage. During the ensuing string interlude, a filigree triplet pattern reminiscent of an old-fashioned music box tune emerges. The vocalist enters on the triplets motif and spins it out further, supported by a variety of textures and strings. The piece returns to the beginning lines to bring it to a reverent close, remembering. It's uh, indeed a pleasure to introduce our composer this evening and poet for the month of June, Charles Zaphis, reading her poem, Kerosene Lamp. right before bed. <clears throat> Dad would light the old crystal lamp. He'd raise his hands, casting shadows on the walls, and we'd be off, spilling tales, our tongues tumbling whatever rolled into our heads. Fragments of light twirled on the ceiling, spinning me farther and farther away from the stones of our words, until I would start to slip deliciously dizzy towards sleep to the tinkling of crystals and faint scent of smoke.
Following the next song, Fourth of July night, there will be a brief intermission. Fourth of July, Fourth of July night, a poem by Marion H. Youngquist is the poem for the month of July. Ms. Youngquist's fireworks, flowers poem is so lovely in itself, but the composer just couldn't leave it alone, and she added further meanings and impressions from Fourth of July. Thus, the piece opens with a military-style instrumental section based on the national anthem. Fragments of the anthem travel from key to key, mingled with drum and cymbal rolls, creating an unsettling effect appropriate following the September 11th attack. Then comes the lush vocal rendering of the poem with rising and falling, falling triadic chords as the voices express the rich magnificence of Youngquist's fireworks flowers. This moves into the first blooms lines added by Ms. Safis, which harken back to the bombs bursting in air words of the national anthem. These climatic phrases include a dissonant, active, electric bass part and a rock music drum beat to call to mind another turbulent time in our country's history, the 1960s. The work dissolves quickly after the flowers fall into ash. The exploding light show in the sky is over. We fold up our lawn chairs and we head for home. Please welcome Marion Youngquist, who will read her poem, Fourth of July Night. Giant rockets boom, hiss, explode into floral fantasies. Golden dandelions, amethyst asters, sapphire hydrangeas, ruby shooting stars, emerald sunflowers, crystal chrysanthemums, petals sparkle, shimmer, pearl, drifting, 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 silence.
Blackberry Range is a poem selected for the month of August, a poem by Gene Ross. Blackberry Rain is composed in the blues style, complete with a sassy trumpet and a pouty soprano, interacting as the story unfolds. <laughs> the strings provide a lazy drawl of seventh and ninth chord harmonies backing up the action. Later in the song, the Zephyrus includes a reference to the tune Somewhere Over the Rainbow as a tribute to the memory of Ms. Ross's father, about whom the poem was written. Please welcome Jean Ross, who will read her poem, Blackberry Rain. The time I came back late from picking berries down the road, you sat in the trailer, smoking a cigar, smiling because you knew how I would look drenched by the downpour that began when I was all the way down the road, picking the berries. With no shelter and no shortcuts through, the stands of birches, brushy thickets, just that long walk back on slick asphalt to the accompaniment of pelting rain, the steady water squeak of sodden shoes. Opening the trailer door to warmth and laughter, the joke was sweet, the shared amusement, yes. But even better, the taste of those berries, black and fine and wet.
Ariana Walking in a Field at Twilight is a poem for the month of September by Sprague Bonnier. Beginning with a brief musical reference to I Dream of Jeannie with the light brown hair, the tenor melody unwinds like a long, silky strand of hair itself. The piano then takes on that strand while the tenor harmonizes. This moves to a short, shimmering piano interlude, followed by a restatement of the tenor theme that continues to unravel to the final phrase of the piece, a run of ascending thirds and the last flourish of wheat-colored curls. It's my pleasure to introduce Bert Sprague Vanier, who will read his poem, Ariana Walking in the Field at Twilight. inside, like wheat, ripening in the fields and pouring amber in the twilight, like the falling of air falling, and the stalks shimmering like her hair in the wheat in the sun setting.
the month of October, the poem is called On the Way to Riley, a poem by C.X. Dillhunt. The happy, rambling message of Mr. Dillhunt's poem, On the Way to Riley, is carried to the listener on a tripping, light, five-eighths meter in the rich tones of the full range string ensemble and the contrapuntal windings of the soprano and tenor voices. Following the string introduction of the main melodic material, the voices spin out Mr. Dillhunt's words like seeds on the wind above the punctuation of the pizzicato accompaniment. In this work, the composer treats the two voices as one instrument. Throughout the piece, they nearly always sing the same words at the same time, though one voice often follows the other contrapuntally, harmonizing the musical line. The safest one is to create a unified human texture rather than a duet with independent or interacting parts to help express the universal experience of happy solitude in the poem. For the month of October, please welcome C.X. Dillhunt, who will read his poem, On the Way to Riley. On the way to Riley. <clears throat> Even before my bike thinks of stopping, I am hopping, happy to be reaching into these half-open pods to release some late fall milkweed seeds, and now before I realize one pod is empty, I go on to the next, and the next flying from pod to pod, even before I realize that I am standing, not riding, and that all the pods are already empty, except for one, getting on and off my bike until I get to the one late fall milkweed pod, the one with a single seed somehow missed by the wind, the last seeker, and I dig it out, set it sailing, and before I know it, the bike is with me again, and again the trail slides on, slides along happy as a single seed, hopping through space, not knowing a name or a number, just floating, never thinking of stopping or landing, and I am spinning along, pedal around pedal, pedaling along on this late fall day, on this trail, on the way to Riley. <laughs>
Getting Ready is a poem for November, a poem by Harvey Taylor. The Zephas chose a folk rock setting for Getting Ready to convey Mr. Taylor's crazy images like weathered fence posts pulling stocking caps down over their gnarly ears <laughs> to get ready for winter. The three vocalists interact throughout, warning each other to be truthful, be truthful, in a rising melodramatic motif. This musical snippet was actually sung by Pamina to Papageno in Mozart's opera, The Magic Flute, toward the end of Act One. After Papageno asked her what they should say to the approaching Sarista, Pamina replies, the truth, the truth, to Papageno, who has a history of lying. The first time Isaphus heard the opera years ago, the little motif struck her as a very funny, and it popped back into her head as she was working on this piece, begging to be included. First, the women chide the tenor to be truthful as he is about to relay the amazing, absurd things he saw in his fall drive. Later, he warns them to be truthful, right before they describe what they saw on their North Country drive, which, of course, tops what he just said. And finally, it is you, the audience. It's your turn to scold the three singers to be truthful be truthful, as cued by the piano player and the conductor before they join forces to get out the message to all non-believers. But can you believe it? You, the audience, you are invited to participate in this song by speaking or singing the phrase, be truthful, be truthful, waving your fingers. <laughs> to the singers as led by conductor Earl Knievers, he is right over here. The audience phrase is, is the same one the vocalist will sing to each other earlier in the piece. The Zephus will give the starting chord on the piano, followed by Mr. Knievers conducting the audience's words, be truthful, be truthful. <laughs> My pleasure to introduce Harvey Taylor, who will read his poem, Getting Ready. My first collaboration with Mozart. <laughs> Getting Ready. It was sort of subtle, but I noticed it anyway. While driving the North Country back roads on a cool autumn afternoon, leaves alchemizing and blushing right before my eyes. Weathered fence posts were pulling stocking caps down over their gnarly ears. Old telephone poles were tying woolen scarves around their skinny necks, way up high near the wires. And a scarecrow, surrounded by a flock of pumpkins, grinned as she put her mittens on. <laughs>
Before the final song, Wisconsin Snow Moon, the Zapus would like to say a few words. Sure. I would like to thank you all for coming to the Poet Songs concert. The work of many people made this program happen. I'd like to thank the poets for their poems which inspire the music. The musicians and conductor for bringing the music to life. The narrator for making the program run so smoothly. First United Lutheran Church for use of a rehearsal space. The Arts Center for putting this event in their new live series. And my family for doing a lot of work behind the scenes and supporting me in this endeavor. Again, thank you all for coming. You are invited to a reception in the outer hall following the concert. There will also be a table set up where some of the poets will have books available, and there will be a place you can order a CD recording of this program if you're interested. Thanks again for the gift of your presence. December, Wisconsin Snow Moon is the title of the poem by Louisa Loveridge Gallus. As Loveridge Gallus, December lament for summer's green ballads to return lends itself to the bluesy style used. The vocal line consists of a progression of descending minor six, cadencing on a rising chromatic hook to cap off each verse. After the third verse, the composer introduces a rousing rendition of the On Wisconsin March with the words changed into a fight song against winter. <laughs> Bluesy lament returns to eventually wind down in a mournful, chromatic, descending phrase on the word moon. But that's not all. For the truly astute listener, the composer embedded fragments from two earlier pieces towards the end of Wisconsin Snow Moon. The vocal line on the words, winter's the only one choosing the tunes, ends on the rising refrain from February's poem, Spring Sonnet. And directly following the mezzo's next words, under our loyal and Wisconsin snow moon, the trumpet and saxophone articulate together a four-note phrase that echoes the chant motif from the January selection, looking up at the Milky Way thought. This brings us full circle in tonight's <coughs> performance of Poet Songs, the Wisconsin Year in Song. <laughs> it's my pleasure, of course, to introduce <laughs> Louisa Loveridge Gallus to read her poem, Wisconsin Snow Moon. Wisconsin Snow Moon. Truly you wish the aloof winter sun would drop its attitude and cozy up to you, just like last summer, crooning, gee, baby, Ain't I good to you? While you slip into your easy clothes to flirt with the breeze. Except this torch song only happens in your dreams. Tucked tight as you are in your hefty afghan, icicles clicking the jazzy upbeat on rims of frosted windows. Summer's green ballads fast asleep beneath huddled drift. Winter is the only one choosing the tunes under our loyal Wisconsin snow moon. Mm -hmm. 